I want to introduce you to our speakers today, who are Chris Childers and Monica Polchow from the I5K workspace at NEL. Uh, Chris, it's over to you. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's good. It's good to be able to come here and talk about our project. And uh, today, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. I'm only going to spend a brief time talking about our background and overview, and I'm going to spend most of my time here giving a little bit more up updates on some of our newer features, including um, what it takes to start a project or to submit data. And then we're going to transition over to Monica, who's going to talk more about some of our uh, post-curation services. And so uh, with that, I'll just uh, jump on in. So as you all know, the I5K initiative is, um, is a broad and inclusive group that's looking to help coordinate the sequencing, assembly, and, and release of 5,000 insect or arthropod genomes. And this is an international effort to help prioritize insect genomes, provide guidelines for sequencing and curation, and also to help procure funding for such a diverse group. Now, the I5K workspace at NAL is um, it's a separate project, but it works to help, help move this all forward. And we're available to help any arthropod project that has genome hosting needs. Over here on the right side is um, just the general genome project trajectory starting all the way at the top of your initial, we have a great idea, we develop our plan, all the way down through the final biological insights and publications in science. And the I5K workspace at NAL, we seek to um, help support researcher goals there towards the um, middle to end of the process. So after you have your genome assembled, you've got some automated um, annotations, then you want to go in and actually refine those. And so we, we provide manual gene curation services as well as official gene set generation and um, other types of genome project maintenance and visualization. So just kind of as like a high level basics, the I5K workspace centers around the idea of projects. And a project is a collection of data based on a genome assembly of an arthropod. And so all of the data that is in this project is used and viewed and accessed in the context of that genome assembly. The other key point is that each project has a coordinator. And this coordinator serves as the point of contact for questions about the project to help uh, pull together the community for that organism. And uh, the main responsibility right now is for the coordinator is to approve uh, new applicants for the Apollo for doing manual gene annotations. And the last key point I want to I want to highlight is that all of our data is user submitted. Now um, why do you want to join the IFK workspace? So the first key point that is that you gain access to a large, diverse community. Right now, we're up to 58 species, and we're actively working on adding more. And this is about 20% of the arthropods that have genome assemblies at NCBI. So it's a sizable proportion of, of genome assemblies that are in INSDC. We also have a very large user community, over 500 different users that have all kinds of diverse interests uh, you have people who are interested in the biology of a specific um, system or, or sort, uh, evolutionary context. And then you have other people that are experts in a species or a species group. And um, they all interface using these common, they all work on it using this common interface. So we found that the barrier of entry for pulling in someone who is interested in the development of vision genes is actually much lower because they can use the same tools, they can use the same sort of interfaces in a new organism. So it's a benefit for new projects that come in and as they have, and it's also a benefit for the scientists who are already there. We also have been working on detailing out policies for data and project management. And this is actually really helpful if you have data management requirements, say, for your grants or for your project. And you can view um, these policies here at the links below, and the slides will be made available. So. Uh, we can, I won't bother reading them out. So what do we do for a new project? So, uh, or what we need for a new project? 
first off, we need your project metadata. And um, metadata is any information about the data that's going to be submitted. So first off, we request information about your organism, including um, the natural history if you have it, um, images, any sort of information you have. Now along with that, we have asked for metadata for all of the submitted data files, including the genome assembly, the automated gene predictions, or any other files. So we're looking for as much information as you can provide on the tools or methods that were used to generate or process these data, including software versions, even options set if you, if you have that. Where and when uh, the data were generated, if they were specific um, organi like individual insects used, where they were collected or when they were collected. Any, any sort of information you can provide is, is, can be helpful to researchers down the line. The other half of that is the data that's associated with those metadata. So the genome assemblies should be um, already submitted to and made it out of GenBank or any of the INSDC um, repositories. And the data should be open access. We currently don't have any support for um, embargoing data sets. And any additional data sets that you may have should already be mapped to that assembly. And once you submit your project and once you have data sets, we will go about and start producing uh, your project. So first we create resources such as uh, various uh, pages on our site by data downloads. We integrate your data with our tools and we also off offer some post curation services. And here I have this in, a, in a, a visual overview. So we take your frozen genome assembly, any automated annotations you may have, and optionally other data files. You submit them and what you get is a beautiful project on the workspace. So we get view organism pages, access to download the submitted data, access to tutorials on how to use our resources and tools. And in addition to that we have tools, we have BLAST, we have genome browsers such a, including JBrowse, Apollo for manual annotation. For other types of search, we also offer Hammer and Questall. And then we do offer post annotation services, which we will talk about more about later. And always there's always challenges, um, including non-standard data formatting and you know a lack of all of the metadata that's needed. What do we not do with your data? Currently, we do not do additional computationally intense analyses such as um, running gene prediction on it or doing RNA-seq mapping. We just currently don't have the capacity to do that for all of our organisms. Secondly, we're not actually a long-term archive or repository. We're a workspace, so it's much more dynamic and, and volatile data that we're, we're working with. There are a lot of good options out there, including NCBI, there's the Ag Data Commons, Data Dryad, Cybers Data Commons, and a lot of other archives and repositories available. So um, in order to start a project with us, first you need an Arthropod Genome Assembly. You uh, accessioned by NCBI. And so uh, using GenBank's accession numbers helps avoid confusion about the assembly version. And it also gives everybody the same um, starting point in terms of being able to access the data and, and interface with the data. And also the GenBank contamination screen really does help to improve the assembly quality. And um, using a stable assembly is very beneficial for the community annotation process. We've seen in the past if people are trying to update too frequently, it's very easy to get confused and have people working on different versions. A couple of other caveats. Um, all the data, as I said, is public. However, we do um, state and support uh, Fort Lauderdale, Toronto agreements for data sharing, whether they should apply. And also, um, is your genome an orphan or are there other suitable databases for it? And we do host genomes that are already um, hosted elsewhere or have, could have homes elsewhere. And we are actively communicating with the other genome database providers. That being said, all the manual annotation efforts should be done at one spot just to prevent confusion or people working at cross purposes in different databases. Um, in order to start 
this whole process, the first things you need to do is to get an account. So you just need to apply for a data set submission account off of our main page. There's a link provided here. And once your, link, once your account is approved, you can submit new projects, you can add assemblies or other data sets. And all of these are done through um, relatively straightforward web forms. To start an IFK workspace project, you really need to start a conversation with us. And to do that is you log in and then you go to the option data, submit data, and then request a new IFK workspace project. And the link here is provided. And um, there's information about what the organism is, the genus, the species, uh, taxonomy, ID, common name, as well as a free text field where you can um, tell us a little bit about your project and its significance and we'll review your submission and we'll reach out back to you to have that conversation about your project. Now um, once that project is approved, you can submit your genome assembly and all of the information is processed through a web-based form and all the information will be um, reformatted for display in various the correct spaces on the workspace except for some of the behind the scenes things such as the email address and the um, file checksums, which are really, they're just to make sure that we get your data transferred properly and we know who to reach out to. And similarly, once the assembly is in place, you can submit your gene predictions. It's another, another web form. And the same thing for additional maps data sets. Now once all of the metadata is, is sent in, then we, want to, then we also need your files. There are currently five ways to share files with us. The first is actually on those data submission forms. You can do direct file uploads. And um, the second option is if you have files that are less than two gigabytes, you can transmit them via FTP. You can, you can um, email them if they're small, under 25 megabytes, and those are not too many files like that. You can provide us with the URL if the file exists somewhere that's accessible. Or finally, you could upload the file to Cyverse and then share it with our organization, the NAL Bioinformatics, and then reach out to us to let us know what it is. Um, honestly, our preferred system is to share the files through the submission forms. And for more information, you can actually go to this link, Sharing Files Us, to um, get more details on all five of those different options. And um, I just wanted to also point out, I mentioned the Ag Data Commons is a potential repository. And it currently hosts any data set funded by the USDA. You load your data set and metadata. You get a landing page, a citable DOI. And uh, we've already got nine data sets from the I5K in there now. And if you'd like a little bit more information, um, you can visit us, i5k.nal.usda.gov. And we also are posting our code up on GitHub. We have a GitHub organization, NAL-I5K. And the, we're also uh, con actively contributing back to the I5K initiative. And we've been working on uh, building up the I5K website, i5k.github.io. And now I'll transfer over to Monica for the second part of our talk. I'll get these slides up in a minute. Okay. All right. Can everyone see the slides now? Just making sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So now we're going to switch gears a bit. Um, again, I'm Monica Polshow uh, with Chris Childers. We I lead the um, co-lead the I5K workspace. Um, and we were going to talk a bit about post-curation services, as Chris mentioned before, and specifically about creating official gene sets at the I5K workspace. So I'm just going to go over a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to tell you what an OGS is and why we do it. We're going to talk about the how of the OGS generation process, so um, what the different steps entail. And then we'll follow up with some examples in future directions of the OGS generation process. So what is an official gene set? 
the official gene set is kind of a, a loose term, um, but, but our best loose definition of it is the best known representation of gene models for a genome assembly. Um, what, when we at the I5K workspace talk about an OGS or generate an OGS, this is a merge between one gene set that is usually computationally predicted and a set of manually validated annotations. Um, often this comes from the Apollo software. So if you look at this image on the bottom, I'm showing you a screenshot of the genome browser. Um, this is the bed bug one I have in this example. And you'll see two different tracks. The top one is Simix Lectularius OGS version 1.2. And the second one is um, just a computationally generated gene set. And so you'll see that the OGS contains a bit more information and some improved models relative to the, um, the original gene set. So this is usually what we're talking about. Why would you want to generate an official gene set? Um, this depends entirely on your genome community's needs. If several groups um, in your community want to perform downstream analyses, it can really help to have that authoritative reference gene set for your community rather than have multiple competing gene sets that people can get confused about um, for their analyses. So, um, but it's also possible that your genome community is small, you're only assembling your genome and generating a gene set for one particular analysis and you're moving on with your life. And that set, it might not be necessary to go through the, the effort of generating the official gene set. So now I'm going to jump into our um, OGS generation process. So, um, and this consists basically of four steps. Here's the first one. So, um, mania annotation occurs, usually by Apollo, and I'll go into detail about what, how we define mania, mania annotation and what it means at the I5K workspace. Once the mania annotation um, uh, process is done, we implement a freeze, which basically means that nobody can annotate anymore. And at that point, we'll stop and we at the NAL will start checking for um, errors in an automated fashion using our software. Um, once we're done checking, we send those errors to the curators or manual annotators, um, those that have to be actually inspected. Um, they'll get back to us with feedback. We'll um, freeze again. We'll check errors again. And this cycle can go on um, hopefully only two or so times, but with some communities it takes a while to get the, the appropriate feedback from the curators. Um, the third step then, once, once all the errors and the man annotations are fixed and everything's hunky-dory, we can merge that, those man annotations with one designated gene set, and then finally we'll release it. Um, so we have some software tools to help expedite this process. It's not entirely um, automated, but you can view um, those tools in our GitHub repo that Chris talked about earlier. Um, and I'd like to mention now that um, the main work that's been done on this has been performed by our, our former postdoc, Meiju Chen. Um, and it's now um, a work on um, developing the functionality is being conducted by our new grad student intern, Li Nei Chen. So these are the, the, um, the people who have been doing most of the development on this package. And just to note, the full process of OG, OG generation is pretty time consuming because it does involve a lot of working with your community. Um, but we are generally available to help perform this OGS generation process for I5K workspace project projects. So um, I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through each of these four steps that I outlined above um, in detail now. So the first step is manual and community annotation. So what is it? In general, manual annotation is the manual review and improvement of an existing gene prediction. Um, often, but not always, this manual annotation process draws on external evidence. For example, RNA seq. Uh, clones, if you see DNA clones as you have them, or homology, homologous genes from other species to improve a computationally predicted gene model. So if you're looking at this example on the right hand side at the top, uh, we have a computationally predicted gene model, and on the bottom is the version of it that was actually manually edited. And there are two different types of manual, um, manual annotation that can be performed. Uh, structural annotation, so if you modify the actual gene structure or sequence, so for example here this model, um, an exon and UTRs were added to this, um, this sugarless model. And the second type of annotation is called functional annotation, so you add a name or, or metadata in general to explain the function of the annotation. So in this example, the annotator added the name sugarless to the manual annotation. So why would you want to bother doing this? 
So um, we can always quote uh, the paper by Mark Kandel in 2012 that states that incorrect annotations poison every experiment that makes use of them. And furthermore, um, not only will they um, make things difficult for your experiment, but we often use these annotations to transfer functional information from one organism to another. And so if you have the incorrect information in one organism, it gets unknowingly spread across genomes. So that's the big, um, the big picture um, reason for manual inspection and correction of automated gene predictions. There are a couple other reasons, though. Um, if you manually annotate, you are capable of linking your gene models to existing literature and ontologies and provide richer data for your entire gene community and um, help you in your experiments down the road. And finally, here's a point um, that one might debate with me. So one current model of the genome paper will often draw heavily from insights confirmed by manual annotation. So this is the reason that um, some genome groups uh, choose to actually go on the manual annotation process, although one can debate with me whether or not that's a, um, that should be a model of, of, of doing manual annotation. Okay, so um, to community annotation, it's just a, a different type of manual annotation um, where scientists collectively um, perform the manual annotation process together. Um, at the I5K workspace, as Chris mentioned earlier, we have a number of resources for community, community manual annotation. We have, um, we provide access to a large community of curators. We give you tutorials, guidelines, and webinars um, for you to help guide the curation process for your community. We have a registration mechanism for new annotators to help them onboard onto the Apollo software. We provide one-on-one -on -one support for questions about annotation. And um, as a result here, I think this is actually a bit out of date number, sorry. But we have at least over 400 registered annotators that have curated over 10,000 gene models using the Apollo software. So we have a, a pretty large user base. So uh, to give some examples about the I5K, about the manual annotation process, I have some examples from the I5K pilot. Uh, just briefly, if you don't know what the I5K pilot uh, is, it's a, a group of, uh, a set of genomes that were generated um, at the initiation of the I5K initiative. Um, about 28 genomes were generated by Stephen Richards and others at Baylor. So I'm going to show you two different um, graphs that illustrate um, community annotations. So here I'm showing you a figure of uh, the number of curators that are registered per organism. So on the x-axis, we have individual organisms that are coded by number. And on the y-axis, there are a number of curators that have um, annotated in those organisms. And so in this example, you'll see that one, we have one super curator, or one super organism that has over 40 curators. And there are other organisms down here, like number 26, that has this one. So there's a lot of variation in activity among organisms, and that's fine. The second graph that I'm showing you here shows you the number of organisms per curator, so that shows kind of the dynamics of how curators interact among organisms. Again, on the x-axis, we have curator by their individual number, and on the y-axis, the number of organisms that each, that each curator um, focuses on. And so we have one super curator on the, on the left here who curates 14 organisms, and some here who just work on one. So over 35% 30, of our curators for the pilot worked on one, more than one organism. So there's some synergy um, in, in using the I5K workspace to do your community annotation. Um, I'm going to show just a result example from the I5K pilot again, just from three species that actually um, completed the annotation process. So this is a table for the Asian longhorn beetle, and a plot for leopard penis, and Clitellarius, and Oncopeltis fasciatus. And uh, each of these groups annotated a substantial number of models, um, so over 1,000 per group. Um, and we have software that can detect whether or not the changes that occurred in manual annotation are functional or structural. And here, 75% um, uh, of the annotations, of the MANA annotations that occurred, were structural um, across each, uh, all three of these organisms. And so this suggests that they had to perform similar amounts of structural annotations to the computationally predicted annotations. And so this would suggest that um, there actually is value to MANA annotation because these predictive gene structures often have inaccurate gene structures that need to be corrected three quarters of the time. And that community annotation um, is a process that can effectively improve team sets. So now I'm going to go into step two. Once you've done the manual annotation process, we need to actually go back and make sure that the annotations that you generated are OK. Um, so the manual annotation process can introduce many errors, even using standard software packages, packages for example, Apollo. The QC program that we've been working on identifies common formatting errors from the manual curation process. And again, here's the URL if you're interested in checking it out. 
It identifies over 50 different error types. And we have another in-house pipeline that's not on the GitHub repo right now that corrects many of these errors. Um, the QC process requires some manual re re review, so not everything can be completely automated. So, for example, we've had some annotators who call their G-model test or config 277. Um, so we have to actually do some manual screens um, that our software can't do for us right now. Um, and also of note, um, note that the I5K workspace staff staff, so and that's me, <laughs> we're not curators in the traditional sense. We do not review the biological validity of any of your models. So if you uh, annotate something as alcohol dehydrogenase, I do not go back and check whether or not your sequence actually is alcohol dehydrogenase. That's kind of the point of the community curation aspect. But we do use this program and some manual um, checks to make sure, to basically do some basic sanity checks of your models. Um, also, we are working on a way of submitting all of the official gene sets that we generate to NCBI, and if we do this to degree of manual review, we'll have to be higher because the standards are slightly different. So as an example of the QC process, I'm going to show you just um, some, uh, some numbers from the Diaphorina, from Diaphorina Citri, um, which has been published here um, with lead author Surya Saha. They actually had a pretty um, neat setup. They had a number of undergraduates perform community curation for the Asian citrus psyllid. And they, they organized it really well, and they only had to do two rounds of corrections, which is actually pretty good. But um, the first number that you'll see is actually a bit scary. There are 513 errors out of 500, uh, in 587 models, and 397 of these actually need cure, cure their feedback. Um, I think with some improvements in the Apollo software, we're actually going to knock down this number. Um, so you don't need to be so super scared about that number. Um, but it's worth stating that there actually are a number of errors initially. Um, after a second round of connection, correct, corrections, we only need to, to get 15, er 15 feedback um, errors on <laughs> feedback on 15 errors from curators. Uh, to the third step of the official gene set generation is the merge process. So once um, we have a clean set of many annotations from you, we can merge it with one set of um, computationally predicted annotations. And so what the merge pro program does in our GFF3 toolkit program, it can identify which gene models in the reference gene set, so your computationally predicted genes, for example, should be replaced by models in the second gene set, so your manually annotated genes, via a process we call auto-assignment. So if you look at this picture on the top, um, your reference gene set is here on the bottom, and there are two gene models. And in this case, the annotator decides to merge them into one manually annotated gene. And so our process goes and actually figures out um, that these two original models need to be replaced by the second model in the merge process. And so this is how it goes. So the auto-assignment program uses both sequence similarity and coordinate overlap, which we think leads to improved results. The program extracts the coding sequence and the pre-mRNA sequences from mRNA features from both gene sets. It uses BLAST, BLAST and to determine which sequences from both gene sets align to each other in their coding sequence, so not, um, not the cDNA, but actually the coding sequence, and it uses these parameters, which are pretty strict. If both models pass the alignment step, we check that the matched models also have coordinate overlap in case there's we had problems with the genome assembly that might have duplicated models somehow that are identical almost. Um, we add this attribute called replace tag with the ID of the overlapping model to the modified gene set. And in cases where there's no overlapping model to replace, there's an empty replace tag. So um, what the program does next after this auto assignment step, um, and also I should mention it's possible to add in your own replace tag if you want to do it manually. Um, it determines merge actions based on those replace tags. So there are five different types, deleting, simple replacement, new additions, split replacement, and merge replacement. So if you look at the example I mentioned earlier, where these two original models are replaced by one, that's an example of merge replacement. And then mod models from the modified main annotations replace models from the reference annotations based on these merge, act merge actions. So uh, as an example, again, from the um, Asian citrus psyllid, in this case, um, uh, one gene was deleted. Over 400 were replaced, just um, one by one. 72 were added, 38 were split, 31 were merged um, for a total of 20, over 20,000 genes in the official gene set. Um, just of note, there are other software tools that can be used to merge gene sets. Ours isn't the only one, um, if you don't like what we're doing. There are combiner tools that use, um, for example, weights for different input annotations, for example, evidence model, 
modeler. There's also Glean. And these programs are good if you don't just have one reference gene set and one new gene set, if you have a bunch that you want to actually combine together to make one, one final combined gene set. There are other overlap-based replacement tools, for example, bed tools um, that don't use sequence similarity as well. And that we think that there might be some problems for fringe cases for these, these types of, uh, for, for these types of overlap-based tools. So finally, um, once we're done, we, um, we did the main annotation, we QC'd it, we merged it, then we released the official gene set to the public. Um, this involves generating new or maintaining old gene model IDs, um, establishing a release date with the project coordinator, generating FASTA files, and adding the gene sets to the I5K workspace database. Um, if we're we're still working on this process, but if you submit, would like to submit to NCBI, we'll also um, hopefully try and get that, uh, work that out with you. So um, just to, to date, we've released, uh, well, not officially, we, we've worked on seven uh, official gene sets from the I5K workspace. A few of those are released, and some of those are still waiting to be published um, from these data sets. In future, there are a couple things that we're working on for the GSF3 toolkit for our merge um, and QC programs. Um, right now, it, it's focused mainly on protein coding transcripts, and Li Mei Chang, our new intern, is working on making it compatible for non-coding DNA. Um, future work will improve methods for merging multi-isoform models. It's currently um, a bit iffy. And also improving the QC process, so how can we improve communications about errors with annotators to make things go faster? Um, if you have any questions, again, here are some links to, um, to our resources and our email address also as well, i5k at ars.usd.gov. Um, if you're a person who's scared at emailing a generic one, just be aware that it's just Chris and me and we're not scary, so feel free to use that address. And thank you to everyone who has helped us so far. Um, I'm highlighting this red box here and Meiju Chang, who's the, the main developer of the GFF3 toolkit that I just talked about today. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. Thank you, Monica. Uh, just as a reminder, if anybody wants to send in questions, please go ahead and send those to me, Anna Childers, uh, using the chat function or through email. Um, and we've received a few questions already um, to either one of you. What if you're, an, uh, you're very active in molecular genetics and, and know a lot about insects, um, but don't yet know how to use Apollo for helping annotate these genes? Right. Um, so we have a number of tutorials up on our website um, on how to use Apollo. So you can go, I think it's i5k.nalistica slash tutorials. Um, we have a number of webinars um, that where we have the PDFs posted up there too, but really for initial um, getting used to Apollo, I would recommend that you go to the Apollo website and go to some of Moni Munoz Torres's slideshows. She has a number of very excellent um, slides posted there that go into very, very um, minute detail about how to use Apollo. And then lastly, um, we also are giving regular webinars at the I5K workspace. We're doing that on a bi-monthly basis. And we don't always do Apollo tutorials, but they, they do frequently show up. And our next one is going to be a, a general Apollo Q&A. So you can look at our, um, what webinars we have lined up. We'll post those also on the I5K um, general website, too. And is that found in the notes and news features section at the bottom of the main page? Uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll post the, um, the I5K webinars on the news um, feature on our web page, too. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Um, another question. Have you had any problems with competing official gene sets? <laughs> um, not so far. Um, but we haven't been around for that long, and so um, there's always always uh, <laughs> potential to have, to have those kind of issues down the road. So far, no, we haven't done that yet. There are some genomes that we host that have alternative assemblies, but so far we haven't had any problems with people, um, with people actually using that. So. I, I suppose this is something that's mostly led by the, uh, the coordinators, and, and they're able to inform their community about which assembly and which gene set um, they're moving forward with. Right. right. And I think that's one um, of the and reasons why we're highlighting communication. It's been key to keeping this working. Right. Yeah. So if, if you have problems with competing gene sets, I mean, we're always, 
um, happy to help media, mediate and negotiate between um, you and other parties if that's necessary. <laughs> So I think you mentioned that you've got 58 organisms that you're hosting currently um, across arthropoda. How many species do you have in the queue right now? Um, what's the process uh, or what aspects of that process are the slowest um, for getting a genome hosted? And is there anything contributors can do to help um, in that process? Any, <laughs> any fail points that you generally uh, see that slow the process? Yeah. Um, so we have five, I think five genomes in the queue, and I've been bad since it's been the end of the fiscal year and I've had other stuff to do. So right now, um, getting the genomes up is mainly me. Um, I'm going to try and um, get some of our interns to help with that too, so that's one of the things that's manpower. Uh, things get slowed down if there are problems with your gene set. So um, we do recommend that if you do uh, submit a gene set to us um, or a whole project, that you use the QC program that's already set up, um, listed under this GitHub repo under NALFFK, um, and the GSF3 toolkit, um, and that, that will give you some idea if there's some problems with the data set. Um, if, if it's not an official gene set that you want to post with us, then if it's just a, a computationally predicted track that you want to have on the browser, um, that's not a huge deal. We can just uh, slap that up, and we won't put that actually in our database. Um, so those are the main things that are um, kind of an issue right now, is if there, if there are problems with the data sets that you submit, and then it's my time. Okay. Um, is, is there any idea or plan towards moving toward a model where you'll be able to pull that data in from SRA? I know you mentioned that you have five different ways to pull in data. Is that another means of, of getting data into the website rather than just user submitted data? Right now, we did not, do not have plans to become kind of an aggregator website. That's how I would see that is where, for example, if the I5K workspace became a place where you would find the data for every single genome assembly, arthropod genome assembly on Earth. Uh, we don't see that in our scope right now. Um, that said, um, even for RNA-seq data sets, I think this question was meant to be uh, about RNA-seq data sets for species that you do host. R O, OK. Um, we we are thinking about that. Um, we we're not at a point yet where we can say that that will become a service, um, but that's crossed our mind, and we're thinking about that. And in part, so so that and uh, one thing I wanted to mention about the early earlier way I interpreted your question. So we're we're the portal, we're the genome portal for the I5K community and for arthropods in general. And so, if there are any features that the community wants us to exhibit and to develop, we are always happy to have feedback on that and to get suggestions. Um, and we're probably going to have a, a webinar um, in the next few year or so where we try and solicit that kind of feedback. So um, in, in general, if, if, this, if there's a strong push from the community to do a certain service, then we will definitely consider it. And if we can make it work, we will we'll make it work. Um. Great. Um, I think you guys mentioned that the genome has to be uh, submitted at, uh, through an INSDC database. Um, do you know what the minimum genome assembly metrics are uh, for, for doing that? In other words, can the assembly have a million contigs? Does it need to be assembled uh, to the point of having scaffolds? Are, are the, is there anything that you've found if, if people want to move ahead with the annual annotation that really works well within Apollo? Um, maybe there's a certain number of contigs or scaffolds above which uh, manual annotation becomes too fragmented or difficult. So for um, submitting to us, uh, so for, submitting, for, for submitting to the INSDC, I actually don't know if there's any minimum standard. I don't think there is. It just has to be. Um, fit the technical definition of an assembly, and you have to do their QC and um, implement their, their um, contamination screens. For us, we do also do not have any um, minimum, minimum barrier to entry to put your data in the I5K workspace, but you also talked about when it's worth doing man annotation. And, and we don't place a barrier on that either, but we do, um, we can tell you some, some lessons learned, I guess. And in general, if you have a pretty small contig N50, so not necessarily scaffold N50, but contig N50, um, many annotation is going to be pretty, pretty hard for you to do, simply because 
your gene annotations are probably going to be bad and your assembly is going to be fragmented and uh, the doing many annotations in that scenario will become an exercise in frustration. Um, but there are use cases where that, that would be something that you would want to embark on if you do have a, a fairly fragmented assembly but you do want to get some gene structures out then many annotations would be the way to go because the computational process won't, won't actually give you those gene structures. So, yeah, so if, if you're doing community annotation, it's worth bearing in mind that it can get frustrating the worse your assembly is. And usually we've seen that it's config and 50 that will give you a good idea. Is there, is there a good place for users to look to see genome assembly completeness and continuity metrics for the organisms that you're hosting? Yeah, so we have those on um, the website for each organism page. Um, if you scroll down to, if you go to your organism page, sorry, I don't have an example up here right now. No, um, but um, if you if you go to the organism page and go to the bottom, we do have basic assembly metrics that are listed there, and, um, and which includes contig and scaffold and 50. But it's really pretty basic right now. Um, we are hoping to um, implement uh, assembly stats. Um, so we are hoping to show assembly stats for each assembly that are much more rich and descriptive in the future, but we don't have that up and running yet. Okay, um, and I've got one more question, and please feel free if anybody, if there's any other questions, go ahead and send those in. I've got one more question. Um, do you have any updates or expansions to tools that are on your roadmap? It sounds like you're planning on expanding those uh, assembly metrics. Is there anything else that's on the near-term roadmap? So for the GSF3 toolkit, we're, um, we're planning on doing those um, improvements that I mentioned before. Um, Chris, do you have any updates for the tools? So we're working on, we are working on adding in some additional fe features to our search tools. And um, right now, we're still trying to just get work, prototypes working. I'm not quite ready to announce, announce anything right now. But we are working on finding better ways to let people interact with their data and, and interact with their searches so and and tie them more tightly into the rest of our the work workspace and we are also in the process of migrating to the new version of Apollo Apollo 2 but it's turning out to be a much more difficult task essentially the um, the scale that we're at now is just there's is a lot of inertia required to migrate nearly 60 species and hundreds of users and trying to coordinate all of that because it's completely different different on the back end and front end. So, so we're working towards it and we're getting close, but it's not quite ready yet to roll out. Okay, and so uh, this, is, this might be a little bit tougher question. Where do you see the project 10 years from now, <laughs> given that we are talking about the I-5K in terms of 5,000 insects, uh, where do you all see yourselves by 10 years from now? It's a good job question there. <laughs> good question. So, right, so one of our goals for this next year is to um, improve our content in terms of what's called um, fairness with capital F-A-I-R. I don't know if you guys have heard of this, but it's um, basically implementing principles for making your data more um, shareable, findable, interoperable, accessible, um, which right now, um, we're, we're not doing a very great job on that. So the idea is to have, um, when we implement your metadata, when we set up your metadata for our pages, um, to have the metadata actually um, in a, a controlled vocabulary that is then machine searchable. So for example, if, if Vectorbase wanted to come and pull our metadata out, there would be a um, standardized way to, to do this. And this is where I see where we really need all databases actually need to focus on for future. We want to become scalable and, and still exist 10, for years, 10 years from now is to actually ensure that all the data, data and metadata that we um, have on our sites actually adheres to these principles um, to the degree that's possible to make sure that any other website or any person who wants to computationally retrieve it or understand what it actually means can actually get that from the website. Um, so that's something that we're going to be working on um, to improve this year, and it's, it's, it's something that I know our, so we're, the software that we use to actually, um, uh, for our databases is, is uh, called Triple, and there's a very active community that's developing it, and they're also very keen on, on um, making sure that these principles are implemented from the software side of things. 
So that's, that's one of the things that I'm, we're, we're thinking about in terms of sustainability for the longer term. Um, in terms of uh, 5K, um, we definitely also need to work up on our process on scaling. As I mentioned before, we have five in the queue, and it's um, my time um, that is solving some of this. So we're, we're also working on streamlining um, submission forms, on um, streamlining getting the data from those submission forms and from our data repositories into the database and using these uh, pipelines that we're working on, like the QC pipeline, to automatically do the QC and improvement. So um, we, we have a couple things that have already been in the works for a year or two that should help us um, become more sustainable and become a bigger database. But I think anybody who's running a genome database will know that actually doing that kind of scale for 5,000 is going to be a challenging, a challenging prospect, and we're, we're going to have to keep on working to, to get there. Um, sounds like you need a lot more interns, I, but I, I think that's, that's where we all are. It sounds like you guys are doing great um, at automating those things where you can and identifying those, those issues. Um, I had another question. Are there any data format standards or conversion tools that can incorporate annotation uh, or curations made outside of Apollo? For example, if a person decides they would rather work offline and generate a bunch of curated gene models, how can those easily be incorporated uh, into your manual annotation track? So um, I can take a stab at that, and maybe Monica, you can. Can I can I actually uh, read over the question again? Sorry. So Monica, you can help help if I if I miss anything. But honestly, right now, this kind of goes back to the last answer that there are data format standards, but a lot of the used to make these files formats that we use. They have different standards, so that um, we still run into data formatting from some of these like standard commonly used. Formats. So um, the short the short answer is there are options if you say if you decide you want to use whatever thing and you generate a GFS three of your annotations, you could potentially. Load them, at, load them into Apollo as a user submitted track and then manually add those as annotations. So you do your bulk of your processing on your own machine, then you come in and then you just add them in through the Apollo interface. And I think there may be other mechanisms, well I know there are other mechanisms that we've not explored for that. And um, that's a really good, it's a really good question for future usage as to how we could more quickly do that. But we definitely don't want to, uh, we don't want to make it too easy for people to just bulk dump in automated annotations and call them manual annotations. So we, so I've been very hesitant to allow for automated processes for just batch annotation submission. I'll make a comment to, uh, it has to do with job security. Do you want to introduce if yourself? I'm sorry. Am I muted? No, go ahead and introduce uh, yourself. Yeah, this is Kevin Hackett. Hi. So, with regards to job security, with the Earth Biogenome Project, we're talking probably over a million species. So, there could be a, additional uh, demands. <laughs> <laughs> we're obviously going to have to come up with different systems as we move forward, yeah. and that's one of the things that I5K Workspace needs to do with others. Mm -hmm. All of us trying to figure out how we're going to move into this brave new era of, uh, of massive numbers of genomes at some point. Anyway, just a thought. Yeah, and hopefully this, um, obviously there's always a lot of value in, in a lot of different ways of formatting data. There's reasons why people uh, have genome databases for single organisms, especially in situations where there's a lot of depth and the community is very active in those situations. But those websites can be in danger of losing funding. Um, and um, be going defunct over time, and that's, uh, they also don't have the value of these shared resources and, um, and, and common tools and applications. So hopefully uh, Chris and Monica were able to explain to you some of the, the value that they can present in, in those ways. Um, and unless anyone has any uh, other questions, I think that we'll end there. And I just want to thank everyone again for tuning in. Um, and I want to tell you that we are working on additional uh, webinars uh, that will include topics such as sequence assembly, repeat and transposable element annotation, uh, as well as some of the biobanks that are available for hosting the material that these 
uh, genomes uh, will be sequenced from. So it, more information on those webinars will be posted to the website soon. And certainly if you have information or if you have speakers that you would like to see or topics you would like to address, please uh, send us that information and we'll do our best to get those uh, on the, the schedule. So thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye.